Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, my name is uh, Patrick Pulsinger, and uh, this is my friend and colleague. Sometimes it's not, you know, it's not both, but in this case, it's friend and colleague, Sam Eel. Um, we know each other for six years now, um, and um, we make music together for like about five years, and. Um, I started making music in the early 90s. Um, I had a label going for um, more than 10 years called Cheap Records in Vienna. And um, so uh, at the moment I do a studio. I have a commercial, more or less commercial uh, recording studio where I do recordings, masterings, mixings. Uh, but I also do my own music there. And, and um, we met each other. Uh, because Sam was an intern in my studio, he um, right yeah. so somehow was it an internship? Yeah. I'm just gonna see if this. Oh yeah, no, it's working. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, I studied recording engineering in Vienna, and um, I uh, needed one last month of like studio internship and uh, tried to track down Patrick. I guess for it took like one and a half years because he's a he was he's a busy guy and. Um, and th then it's yeah in the end it kind of worked out and we we worked on a soundtrack together that Patrick was doing for a film uh, Austrian kind of documentary uh, cinema film and uh, s then we started um, I was assisting him as an as a kind of a sound editing engineer and mixing and uh, then we did the uh, this the the credit roll song for this this documentary and because. Um, we both come, I mean, Patrick has been making music since the early 90s, so obviously very hardware based. Um, with me, I'm, you know, I'm, I started with uh, in the late 90s or early 2000s with, with a really early version of uh, Logic and so entirely software based, but basically since the mid kind of 2000s, um, almost entirely on an MPC 1000 and kind of editing and mixing on the computer, but the production in hardware. So basically, we both are kind of hardware guys, um, just in general. Or we, uh, so even though we had basically different um, backgrounds, Patrick is more, you know, early uh, Austrian techno scene and experimental music. I'm I come more from kind of hip hop, reggae, and jazz. Actually, a jazz pianist in my teens and uh, hip hop production for friends in Bavaria. And um, but we both were uh, reggae and dub fans since forever and I, I used to DJ a lot of reggae and Patrick has also been always kind of you know in, uh, a fan of that kind of music so when we um, after making this 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 song for this um, documentary we said like hey kind of the whole hardware workflow worked really well and we said like hey we should actually make more music together because we have a similar approach although you know we have uh, from like two generations in a way of you know music production and um, but yeah coincidentally it worked out very well and uh, then when we decided to do this project as as Pulsing and Earl, because we both have, you know, solo project, I make solo music with different friends. Patrick has, you know, has done countless projects with all kinds of people. And we said like, okay, we should, you know, we should maybe think about a tiny, you know, concept. Very, I mean, we do what we want to do anyway, but we thought like, okay, maybe there's something that we could somehow have a common ground because um, you, you can also get completely lost. And so we said like, okay, maybe like, kind of a reggae dub thing but hardware music and kind of somewhere between dub house and kind of Detroit techno uh, meeting with his more kind of experimental techno background and my maybe more like reggae and jazz hip-hop kind of sample background so with this MPC thing and kind of sequencers and yeah that's kind of how this project started and the interesting thing is that uh the initial thing, how we actually uh, thought about uh, uh, to play live is that we first, when we thought about making a record together, uh, the first thing that we got a call from a friend, if we want to play live, and we never, play, we never played live before, and we haven't done uh, a record before we uh, started to play live, because um, uh, we played at this party in Vienna, which is like a big party, it goes on uh, every year, and... Um, and so they invited us and say, yeah, you know, we heard you make music now together. Why don't you do it live? And we thought like, okay, you know, um, we, we don't have a record. We didn't record anything yet, but you know, let's just try to do it live. So the interesting thing here is that we really always start from, uh, from a live uh, um, setup perspective because we both have quite uh, 
good equipped studios, but uh, we thought we're going to sit down with a qu quite minimal uh, uh, setup. And um, so when we make music in the studio, um, the studio is actually, we leave the studio switched off and we build up our live set in the studio so that we, we can make the tracks uh, in the same way that we can that we can do it live then later on. So um, we try to, avo to avoid the computer as much as possible. Um, we both work with the computer. Um, it's a necessity nowadays, but um, when we make music, we, we, we try to arrange the music more or less like in a live kind of flow. So um, um, as we also do live, because there's nothing pre-programmed, we do the arrangements live. We, you know, um, I say like, okay, let's do a break, and then we do a break. So every concert is really this uh, is really uh, different. There's nothing really prepared uh, except some loops and some patterns, but uh, we do the uh, arrangements there. And we we were trying to um, get this live vibe into the studio when we recorded our first record back in 2016. We did an album uh, called Mart, and we also came out on on double vinyl because everything we do comes out on vinyl because. We like the analog kind of recording and thing. Um, so we thought like, why don't we ch take this live jams and try to like put them into a, uh, into a record. And that actually worked out really well in, 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 in two ways. The first thing is, for me most important is, we were really, really quick. Because there's nothing I hate more than like uh, programming a track around for like three or four months and change the loudness of the hi-hat one dB down and the clap maybe half a dB up. I hate that. Like when I started to make music, there were no computers around where you could record audio. The only thing I had was a MIDI with the Atari uh, computer. So, you know, switching patterns meant switch patterns on the machine and you make your arrangement. And uh, w with the computer, I, I, I tended to get more and more focus on little details. And I found out that it really was um, uh, it, it was really hard not to not to lose the big picture of the track. So when we started to work together, I realized this is this is really a way to go. Uh, we sit down and we make a track a day. Like we put the stuff together and it sounds good. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good. All right, let's record it. And um, so in that way, we are really productive, um, and um, and we can try out a lot of different things. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, we just skip it and move to the next one. So there is like uh, a lot of diversity in, in our music. I mean, it, it's based a little bit around this Detroit, maybe dub uh, uh, thing, but there is also like the, 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 the BPM range is really, really wide. Like we, it's like maybe from 85 to like 130 or something like this. So for us, it's more like the sound and um, and also in the studio, we try uh, to record a lot of stuff on tape. I have a multi-track, uh, two-inch tape machine. And uh, so what we do is we record multi-channels on, on, on the tape. We do minor uh, uh, adjustments later on before we do the mix, also in the arrangements. But basically, we, we, we try to really get a good take and then just straight put it on the record. Yeah, um, as Patrick was saying, um, you know, we don't make music. Uh, I don't know how much you know you've heard of us, I guess, but we don't make like the most hardcore automated, you know, super complex, glitched out, you know, really tweaked, you know, pro Ableton whatever uh, music. So that's that's a different approach, which is you know great in its in its own uh, kind. Um, for I guess it's uh, more like uh, um, you know an improvisational factor in a certain style of music. Obviously, you know, we're not we don't have uh, ten thousand parts in our songs. You know, they're built around certain grooves and. We are happy with that, you know. We make more or less groove-based kind of dub-influenced music, and so uh, a certain limitation with hardware. Also, stuff like the MPC is the main sequencer of um, of everything. It kind of you know clocks the whole apparatus, and uh, you know you can do quite a lot and chop around a lot. But it's 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 no Ableton, obviously. You know you can, and I I like the fact that you have to kind of. You know, nowadays it's it's you know the uh, possibilities are infinite. You know, and people make really cr cr wild music um, purely you know digital or, or based on a digital software. For us, it's it's like you know live jamming with hardware, working with those limitations, recording maybe onto the computer, uh, partially onto the computer before, partially directly to tape, but kind of recording multi tracks on the computer, maybe 20 minutes or 15 minutes, cutting out the 
best parts or cutting out you know parts that aren't so good, kind of pushing it together, maybe doing two or three overdubs and then kind of playing it onto tape, doing the final mix and, and kind of just being done with it. And as Patrick said, you know, I think it's very uninspiring for me, you know, or for, for us to like say, okay, is the bass drum you know loud enough? Should we EQ it more? Should it you know is is something to um, does something need more compression or less? And um, especially with tape, um, things kind of work out most most of the time. You know, if you have a uh, I would say good a good signal chain, you know, even in a kind of lo-fi sense then if it sounds the way it's supposed to sound, then you don't have to spend uh, uh, you know, months tweaking it, which, is, which other people do, and it's, that's fine, but I guess it just, you know, we don't have the, the patience for it or, um, or, or aren't really searching for that kind of a, um, you know, I don't Especially know. Especially for this project. Yeah, as for this project, yeah. This is I mean, we, we, uh, hardly yeah. we hardly use, we hardly use uh, uh, outboard compression stuff, sometimes a little bit. But um, since we, we, we play everything over the tape, it has a certain saturation, saturation. it has a certain old school uh, sound that we like and it works out for our music. It might not work out for everyone and for every style, but we kind of like found a way um, um, to work quick and get a, a decent, good, for us, good sounding uh, uh, result. And, um, and so the other thing which is, which is interesting here is that when we do our live set, we use all the old uh, kind of syncing and clocking formats. We use uh, we use um, we use MIDI, of course, MIDI clock. We use MIDI uh, uh, for 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 uh, for triggering synths. We use CV and gate. We use the good old Roland DIN sync. So we have like all the old school kind of uh, sync flow going on, and this makes it very very stable. Um, we didn't really have a we didn't really have a, like with all the shows that we played, we didn't really have a problem that something was running out or something was like uh, uh, not working out. If, it, if it's running, then it's running. And if you're performing like this, you can really put aside the technical side. The technical stuff, if the sound check went well, doesn't matter anymore. The thing is locked, the thing is grooving, and then we just, uh, you know, we just improvise our tracks. And this is something that I really enjoy with playing live. There's nothing, for me, there's nothing worse than a complicated setup that is kind of like, you know, you don't really know if something is working out or if the, if the sound card is making dropouts or if the controller is hanging at some point. This is all this, uh, this is the kind of stuff I really want to uh, avoid playing live because when I play live solo, I also, also only play without the computer. I play with modular scenes or sometimes also with tape machines. So I think um, for me, the mind has to be on the performance, on the music, and not on the technical aspect. So this is why we try to keep the setup relatively uh, uh, small and, and, um, and easy. Yeah, we still have you know, two suitcases full of stuff. And I always have the paranoia, and I think Patrick as well, today in the morning before flying, it's always like, you know, if you forget, w I don't know, if I forgot these, these two cables here for the 202, which is the baseline synthesizer, I always have this this fear, you know, you don't have Schneider's Laden next to, you know, the location Not normally. All the time. And I'm always nervous that I think if I forget those cables, there will be zero baseline for the entire show, you know. We might have drums and, and kind of some synthesizers and extra sounds, but there will be no bass. That's like the worst part, to for forgetting one power supply. And uh, so far, we've never forgotten anything. Um, but... Um, yeah, that's like the 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 only stress. But I I also um, I don't know with like laptops, which you know nowadays it's super sophisticated. But for me, this this kind of minor fear that you know if the bass is too heavy on the table and suddenly the hard drive. I mean nowadays with SSDs, it's it's changed, you know. But if it gets too hot, if it gets too humid, you know the MPC and the 909 they work, you know, in the hot panorama bar, you know, with r high level of humidity and and super hardcore sub bass below, and they they haven't, you know, dropped out once they, they don't. Also drop work out. in the forest when it's yeah. raining, yeah. so <laughs> it's yeah. like it's 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 pretty simple. That's that's why we for for us personally, I mean, we're not advocating anything, you know, we're obviously talking about our specific setup, but there's you know there's amazing ways to perform electronic music nowadays anyway especially with all the digital options that you have but yeah i guess it's fun it's also just a a matter of fun you know that you that you don't have to stare into a screen you don't have to be worried that you know i don't know something will break or the f the entire system will crash i mean i always say to patrick if something happens on my side kind of he can just play like drum machine for an hour you know and that's just some people do that anyway so you know that's that's kind of the backup plan um 
that w one of these machines will keep playing. So and it's so far everything's worked. So yeah, that's kind of a um, part. I want to I want to see like who's who's producing him or herself here in in the room. Who's who's a producer? Okay, so and who's playing live of you? Like really li live? Who's taking the stuff out? So not so many, just you. Okay, um, so why is that? I want to hear. Like, like why is why? Uh, I think um, is is there a is there a fear of taking your gear onto the stage, or is there like is there any remark on that? Like, why why w like when you produce at uh, at home or in the studio, um, do you feel a necessity of of taking it out and trying it out in front of the audience, or is it safer at home? Any remarks on that? Why do you take why do you take your stuff out on the street? You mean the playback button thing? I mean, the interesting thing is that we really realized in the last years, or I, I realized in the last, you know, like I make music now for over 20 years, I realized that uh, people are very, very interested again in seeing people doing something on uh, on stage. Um, you know, electronic music isn't so is, isn't really a blast to watch most of the time. It's like one or two guys standing mostly in this uh in this uh, uh, <laughs> kind of uh, a s a state, you know, so, so there isn't much going on. But um, I think even even if the people don't really see what exactly you do on stage, they can see that there's action going on. That you talk to someone in the break, and you see that you make you make decisions on the spot. And this is what I think what makes it interesting. And then there is a really int uh, for me is there is a really um, um, important uh, factor that is. Um, that there's always failure around the corner. I like that. Um, that the possibility that you could really fuck up or that you could really like play this track not so good as you could play it or did play in the studio when you did some rehearsing. Uh, and I think this makes it also interesting for me or makes it interesting for us. And then also there is the, the, uh, uh, the possibility to play your set that is, you know, there are some loops prepared and so so we play kind of the tracks that we know and the tracks from the records but we let's say we could uh, we played f uh, f uh, when was it in summer we played at the lighthouse festival in Croatia and we played at the ambient floor and it's not really ambient our, our music but uh, we decided for a very long time in the beginning that we just play the tracks and just leave the drums out for a very long time just play the bass line and the synths and stuff. And like more echoes and droney stuff. And Dro drones, echoes, and so on. So, so the cool thing is, uh, it it, it kind of gives you the freedom uh, to to choose how your set should be for the audience, for the night, for the occasion. And I think this is great. And we played the same, more or less the same set that we played at Panorama Bar. We played there in the forest, and people were like laying down in the beginning and so on. It was the same tracks, but we just changed them around. And uh, and this is something I I really enjoy and gives me a lot of joy uh, 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 to play live in this way, because for an electronic musician there are obstacles with what you can do live, of course, because some stuff is pre-programmed. You're in a kind of grid or in you're in a kind of pre-manufactured kind of uh, 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 um, arrangement, maybe a little bit. But um, but if you have uh, two people that understand each other really well, and you know, I, I look at Sam, and he knows what I'm saying <laughs> without saying something. And if you have this, if you have this kind of connection, then playing live with electronic uh, uh, equipment, uh, you know, uh, comes to a totally different level. I think. Uh, a friend of mine in Vienna who also makes uh, like has been playing live with a lot of hardware, way more than we like, really a lot of old stuff where the countless things can go wrong and they also go wrong during his sets he, he's kind of a very interesting character and he said like yeah you know it's just because I was also talking ab to him about like playing solo live with my own music which is kind of a similar setup to this just with two NPCs and also with Patrick and he said like yeah you know if you make mistakes it's kind of you know 
punk in a way, you know, not on purpose, you don't make mistakes on purpose, but this idea that you have, um, that you want to like, I want to do a perfect live set, you know, it's going to be everything will work out, you know, every controller and every, every everything you, you actually had planned to do will, will go the way, you know, um, he, he kind of inspired me to accept, you know, that, um, I don't know, that sometimes that, that and that's one of the benefits for, for us with the, with the hardware aspect, not, you know, not saying that it's a necessi necessity is that, you know, stuff happens. And so I sometimes don't hear Patrick because the monitors are really loud or we are too far apart. And he's shouting like, hey, you know, sw let's switch some pattern or, you know, break down the sample or the bass or so. And I don't hear it. And then he does something thinking I'm going to react to it and I don't, you know. And then, uh, or, or the other way around, I just start muting stuff and suddenly he he's in the middle of some sort of like drum solo and um, and actually the most fun parts for us happen if you actually <laughs> miscommunicate in a way. Um, because we don't hear each other or because he just decides to do something that we hadn't done before in another show. I mean, you know, it's always in the, we always are clocked, you know, there's a groove going through, so it's, you know, we're not doing the most experimental music out there, but but still stuff kind of happens and, and uh, it's, um, I think it's more uh, fun to kind of embrace that, like we were playing in, in at the Poodle Club once and uh, this jog wheel here on the MPC, it can, depending on which window you've selected, it can change the sequence, you know, by, by by turning it. And sometimes, if the I I didn't I wasn't aware of that, but the bass was pretty heavy there, um, and on the table, and the jog wheel just turned in the middle of a song, and suddenly, after you know eight bars, and uh, the next sequence started playing in the middle of like, in the middle of the song, totally unplanned, and it would, you know sounded of course kind of stupid, and uh, and for us, yeah. nobody else was yeah. would and know what's going on. And I just stopped, you know, and then kind of we laughed, and these 80, 90 very nice people there in in um, the Poodle Club laughed, and then we kind of continued, and, and uh, you know, it's just a small technical glitch, but I, I think that, um, for me personally, that's more fun, because uh, you see that something's happening, that people make mistakes, it's kind of a, you know, human, uh, and I think uh, the perfect streamlined, you know, one hour Ableton live set, where each track flows perfect into the next one, in the perfect key, in the perfect mix and blend, and it's totally perfectly arranged, and the sound is ideal, you know, that's interesting. Um, in itself has its own merit, but you know it's also kind of boring at some point because you're not sure like what is really happening. And if I, I mean with laptops, the problem is if something happens, it's really shitty, you know. So for this is this is also kind of a safety net that if something goes wrong, it it probably will be rather funny than totally you know than two minute pause because the laptop has to restart. That's that's one of the aspects that um, are enjoyable playing with hardware and not necessarily like vintage hardware but just any form of like midi synced machines and maybe a computer that um that something you know something will keep going and uh mistakes are uh forgiven faster i think that's that's a uh, maybe a i don't know one aspect yeah. um maybe you know um can you see what we ha i don't know what's 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 what, what can you see there but um uh, maybe we if you if there are any questions at any point, just say like raise your hand and say it, say it out. Like there's nothing. Yes, please. Questions is always good, you know. Well, I mean, well, of course, everything comes down to taste. And if you if you if you start to work, and if you have a if you have a good idea, uh, and and you pursue it, and you find a style and a sound that you like, you might you know you might like it for a long time, or you might kind of like um, um, make versions of that idea uh, uh, along the way when you do it for 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 many years, and. Um, of course, I, I like the hardware-based thing, and I always come back to it because it's what I can do easily. I, I like it, I can do it, and know my way around, and I get results quite fast, which I like. Um, I, 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 think, I think for me, making music is ideally something, is a communication between people. 
I don't like to do music alone so much. I make music alone and I like it, but I just enjoy it much more with one or, or some people. And um, and and so the the I think it, it, it's really not a question of uh, what's better or, or not so good. I mean, I embrace technical. Um, um, uh, new things, technical new things, I love it, you know, I mean, techno music for me was something that was always aiming into the future. I don't like, I don't, I don't like to sit back and be like, oh, in the 90s everything was better, and, you know, that's, that's not, that's bullshit, nothing was better, it was just maybe a little bit different. So, but I think is, uh, for an artist, when, you, when you're an artist, when you're a musician, I think to know what you can do good or what you can do best and bring it with into a new uh, form of performance or combine it with new technology, this is something, uh, this is something really important, you know? I mean, y you know your way around certain things and um, uh, for some projects, I have to work with Ableton because I've com people come in and we work in Ableton, no problem with that and I use a controller, I use this and this and that or I even switch, I don't switch something on and I work in the box, that's fine, you know? But, um, I can I can see in the last years that there is uh, not only on the production and uh, not only on the live uh, circus, but also in the production. You can see that a lot of people that uh, use uh, classic drum machines again, uh, that use outboard synths and so on, they look for a kind of uh, rough uh, uh, earth sound, uh, which is not so perfect, you know. I mean, there are, there are nameless plugins that put dirt into your <laughs> into your digital mix. Like, why is that? Because dirt is kind of good, you know. Dirt is kind of cool, and it fits to the music. And uh, and and as Sam said, like the punk appeal uh, f uh, that for for me that that electronic music should have uh, is a is is a is a really important factor. Um, but I'm I'm not thinking that this is like the real deal and the other stuff is just like you know like I just think there is a lot of different sides on, uh, 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 on doing things yes Yeah, I think making decisions on uh, making decisions in the moment, uh, making decisions in the moment where it happens. I think this is something that's really fun. And if you do it with someone who feels the same and has the kind of same, a little bit uh, the same kind of musical background, you know, you think about the same. Like when we played for the first time, there's a really interesting story. When we played for the first time together. It wasn't really a good gig. It was actually, it was not a really good gig. Our first gig because. We didn't have so many tracks and we had a little bit different setup because we didn't really know what to take on stage. So we worked in the studio with, uh, we, we knew we wanted to use a 909 because it's like a classic Detroit drum computer. You can't do really something wrong with the 909. Nice kick, nice sounds, you know, you can do a steady beat really easy. We wanted to use the MPC of course because that's this is what Sam's really master in and uh, we wanted to use a couple of synths but we played like with the spring reverb mixer it has a spring built inside and so on stage there was a lot of bass and of course like the spring reverb was kind of re uh, uh, um, there was like a kind of feedback in the spring reverb and we played everything we had we had we were supposed to play one hour and every track we had we played within the first yeah. 25 minutes i said to patrick at some <laughs> so point we have another 20 minutes and we were like okay uh all right you know and so like we just kept on going but we had no for the first gig we had no concept uh, of like how long should we write something like maybe there's now the time for like a kind of you know we were just like jumping on the patterns and didn't really didn't really know uh, uh, what to do and this is really good I think this is like good to to have also not so good gigs because you learn from that gigs that are not so good and if you play a really good gig that flows around and we hardly ever record our gigs because we're lazy and so on, but sometimes we record them and then you listen back to them at home or, you know, in the studio and then you go like, that's a good gig, you know? And sometimes you listen back and be like, oh, that's, a, that's okay, you know? Like, so the first half was kind of good, but then we kind of lost it. But it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's a reflection of that, which, which also 
keeps you uh, learning from your mistakes and you do something differently and for the next record and for the next live set you might you know try to avoid those mistakes uh, that you that you do live because um, uh, they they directly come from you they are not a decision that you make over a month time of producing a track they come straight from you and I think this is this is very powerful if you can if you can use that in the right way so um, should we maybe explain a little yeah. bit technically um, do can you see what we have is this kind of like um, I don't know. Is it been yes? No. We, yeah. we, we can try to like go through before we I don't know play. Um, and if there's like technical questions Anytime. to like things and like technicalities we are speaking, which you know for us are like a natural thing, then just you know you know interrupt us. We're not you know this is not a lecture, so please just um, you know if you wonder how things are connected. I mean I can maybe start. It's it's you know it's it's kind of straightforward because um, that's the way you know MIDI and. Um, uh, maybe, maybe, d d sorry, yeah. sorry, maybe sorry. before you start, um, for me the most important thing is we use a DJ mixer in the middle. This is like where everything comes together. Why do we use a DJ mixer? There's two, uh, there's two main uh, things where we do it. First of all, I wanted to feel our live set to be a little bit like a DJ mix. It says not, not, not a lot of little things that you want to tweak. I want to be just like, tuck, tuck, you know, jerk the bass out, you know, like maybe use the filter, use the effect from the DJ mixer because they are easy to use. It's fun to do it, you know, like tap the delay, do a delay, and we can both be on the same on the same uh, uh, mixer because it's in the middle. And this, the second thing is when we travel, we don't, we, we cannot take so much, so many things. So, you we everywhere have you go, we already have a, a lot of stuff to we carry. We have yeah. a lot of stuff. So everywhere you go, there is a DJ mixer. So where there is a DJ mixer, we can play. Our sound check takes really, really short time. Even we play like this, um, and there is nothing, no technicality, uh, no technical uh, 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 bullshit we can run into. As long as there is a DJ mixer, we can play. So, um, so this is just uh, the you know, it's just a very fun. A way to do it just on a on a on a four-channel uh, stereo DJ mixer. Yeah, so Sorry. So the basic setup, um, as far as you can see, that is um, so the main thing is a MPC 1000 uh, Akai sampler, where um, I've been working with this for a long time. And when we started collaborating, as Patrick said, that's kind of the it's the easiest thing to have as like a master clock. So this each each pattern or each song we play obviously you know has a tempo and that syncs the 909 and the uh, electribe uh, drum machine and the TB303 so this is kind of the master hub and uh, on here um on the MPC you know I'm not I'm not doing like uh, live MPC you know finger drumming stuff like in you know certain right. yeah but but very rarely it's mainly it's mainly kind of a, a sequencer when we do it live you know we program stuff in the studio all the songs and because um, we work the same way, maybe with a th some different synthesizers in the studio, I have all the patterns on the MPC. So that's like the main, kind of the main, you know, main hub for the basic information. So on here we have, um, you know, programmed samples, uh, mainly recorded from like vinyl records and chopped up, cut around, filtered, pitched. Then there is also um, basically the baseline for the 202, which is a Roland 80s, um, monophonic bass synthesizer, kind of like a small SH-101, um, if you know that, um, has a really fat um, low bass, although it feels rather cheap and like a piece of plastic, but it's a... Yeah, we can play the 202. This sounds like this. So it's very deep. And this goes into the mixer, which is um, here. I had to put it up like this because um didn't have enough space. And uh, yeah, I can. And there are no presets on this, so yeah, whatever you do for every song, you just quickly set the filter. You just quickly set the 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 the, uh, the color of the sound. But um, but sometimes you also go too high or make mistakes, and this makes it kind of yeah kind of lively. So that's, that's our main bass machine. Yeah. this is like where the bass comes from. And it's a really heavy heavy bass that um, I can definitely recommend. It's you know. Roland vintage stuff is has gotten quite expensive, but this is still one of the semi cheap ones. Um, has a super heavy bass, especially for our dub stuff, so that that works very well. Yeah, and then there's also, for example, I have the mini log, which I 
I don't really use in the studio very much because I have a you know other options uh, that I've collected over the years. But it's a pretty good live synthesizer because it's you know it sounds o good, pretty good I would say, regarding the price. You know, analog synths or polyphonic analog synths are very expensive uh, if they're vintage ones. Nowadays, you know, in the last ten years there's been a lot of new production of. Um, analog equipment so uh, it's gotten more affordable which is really good you know like with all the clones and reissues coming out but it's 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 very sturdy and it's lightweight and it fits into a carry-on backpack which is a really important um, factor for traveling um, I play this live and I also um, send in um, more or less simple sequences kind of or chord changes like like this this is just um, it's going into the echo now so this is just a mini log it goes into this um, small, uh, I guess, like late 70s, maybe early 80s, uh, Ibanez phaser, because um, it can sound a bit hard sometimes, or harsh live on a big sound system. So I, this makes it a bit more kind of, um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, creamy. creamy and elusive kind of. And then, I, then this goes into the RE20 Space Echo um, uh, Boss effect pedal so you can send it in there and it's it's a pretty good echo for you know live use and uh, and it has a really heavy tap button which is also important for live so even if it's dark and you i don't know maybe even a little bit drunk you can kind of you know kind of you you'll find it to tap it and it's it doesn't have any sync so we we tap it live which is kind of nice yeah that's also the main echo for my part and also patrick has his own yeah, so these are basically the two machines that are controlled via MIDI, the MIDI log. I also play on top of that uh, MC202 as baseline. And then there are, um, depending on the song, different samples. For example, with this track, there's like um, mainly just um, percussion sounds from, yeah, kind of old, uh, uh, all kinds of records mixed together. So like a percussion loop. Um, and uh, or this here, and I, I kind of or we kind of like the mixture of vinyl samples and kind of the drum machines and analog synths because they um, you know they work pretty well together and it, it adds maybe also some dirt to because you know the 909 is a pretty heavy drum machine but also a bit of a cleaner drum machine it's it's kind of snappy and and Patrick's is um, was restored by a technician and it's like in very good shape so it really punches out very kind of a warm but more more cleaner you know old school sound it's not like the most distorted or nasty sounding drum machine so the combination of like um vinyl drums like this and the 909 kind of blended together that's that's maybe also kind of more our thing you know this this kind of vinyl hip-hop approach and kind of old school drum machines to and not have and, and and sam does a lot of digging in 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 uh in uh, used record stores and he comes up with the most awful records like literally the crappiest records but then on track number five on the b-side there's a really nice tom break or so so it's a, the classic kind of sample hunting and um you know in a I, I think in a in a world that it's filled with sample packages pre-manufactured sample packages to find something that nobody has has has, has found before it might sound a little bit childish or funny, but as for me, sometimes that really makes the track that keeps me going on an idea because it sounds fresh. It's a kind of it's a kind of treasure hunt thing, and I think that that makes it fun. And uh, and and this is so important for making music uh, to find something um, that you think nobody has found before. Uh, it's just or it's just so shitty, you know, the record that it's it's like a, you know, you're kind of like uh, uh, it's a. You can laugh about the covers a yeah. lot. We laugh about the covers I a lot, like from the especially from the eighties. Yeah, these like saxophone records, you know, the from the late from the seventies and early eighties. They they're really terrible, but they have like maybe if you're lucky, they have like you know the first bar is a drum intro, and they always have really fat drums, but there's always saxophone on them the entire song, um, and uh, really corny kind of lovers music from the seventies for I don't know like schlager kind of, but. Yeah, so often that's kind of stuff, um, all kinds of stuff that we use. And uh, yeah, so to keep it simple, samples come from here. In other tracks, harmonic samples like chords or certain melodies, 
Then this goes into my mixer, which is a very simple Yamaha mixer. Also, it's it sounds pretty good and it's lightweight. Um, also, an important factor when you if you play and travel with a lot of gear, because the MPC is really heavy, so you kind of reach the whole like luggage weight at some point quite quickly, um, which is something you have to be aware of because it's can get very expensive flying uh, with the and you have to carry it. So, yeah, and this goes into the mixer. I have this echo here and have one AUX send uh, on the mixer to send into the echo. So to go you know, into the delay. And uh, that's it. You know, th that's it's pretty straightforward, but um, especially for, you know, if I could, I'd probably take more pedals, but it's just, you know, it's already in most situations pretty tight. And that's one of the downsides if you you know, one of the good and bad things, if you play with hardware, you would. I would also like to have a chorus pedal after the mini log, or you know, maybe a, s a second delay. Or maybe I would like to have a second aux send on this mixer. I don't have it, and it's not really possible physically to transport these things. So you kind of have to just work with it, and it works quite well. Then, as Patrick says, I go into the mixer. Um, the uh, MIDI clock from the MPC, so the tempo information goes over to Patrick's side uh, into a MIDI through. So a MIDI splitter has one input, four outputs. And from there on, um, kind of his side is synced to mine. Um, do you know the basic uh, um, um, difference between a MIDI clock and a DIN sync, uh, CV and gate? Are you interested in that? If you're interested, I could break it down shortly. If you're not interested, you just look at me like that and I to keep going on. Would you be interested? Like, what's the difference? Okay. Um, uh, in order to make the machines work together, I mean, nowadays most of the machines have a have a USB uh, uh, connection. You connect them to your computer. You select them, and they will run in time with your computer. If you don't work with the computer, uh, the only thing you really can do is use some um, some kind of syncing, some kind of clocking. And in the past, there were uh, some things that are even used still today. Um, the thing which is probably most uh, known is MIDI. Um, that's uh, actually a format where you can um, transmit uh, information to a synthesizer that tells the synthesizer what to know to play, when to play it, etc. You have like MIDI aftertouch, kind of all kinds of information, but you also have a MIDI clock. And a MIDI clock just uh, tells, for example, uh, uh, this drum machine, the 909, uh, when to start. Uh, just that, and 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 to run on what kind of uh, um, uh, what kind of BPM. The interesting thing about this is that you still use the internal sequencer from the drum machine, which is a good thing because all the drum machines have a kind of uh, a little bit different groove. So when you program something in the computer and you and you quantize, everything has the same groove. But like a 909 has a different groove than a 606 or an 808 or an Electribe. So they all kind of like run within their own kind of mojo, which I think is really nice and, 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 it, and it underlines the, um, the characteristic of the drum machine. So when, when, when using um, a MIDI, MIDI, MIDI sync, um, the machine just, they just run together and maybe we can do the, we, 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 we can do the beat. And uh, so, we have this, this 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 sample groove, and I just uh, I just have the, the the 909 running. Uh, just in sync, maybe you can see it on the video. I don't know. Um, for live, I love to use 16-step uh, uh, drum machines that have a running light uh, because you actually see what is going on when you play live and when you look at it. If you have a, a, a drum machine that is programmed with just pads, like the MPC, um, for me it's not so easy like to see where you are, what you do, which patterns you're at. You would have to read uh, some information on a, on, a, on a display. I don't want to read the information on a display. I just want to look like this and see, okay, this is the second pattern, third pattern, and so on. So what I, what I do is I really just switch patterns by hand. So um, if I want to do like breaks, I just I just make them by hand. Sim. 
simple. And uh, so the 909 is just a just a really really basic sequencer. And for life, I think it's a uh, it's 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 one of the it's one of the easiest to use uh, uh, machine. Sounds sounds perfect. Um, you have a for every instrument. You have a level control that you can just turn up and down whatever you do. You have a minimum of par parameters that you can adjust by playing live. For example, for example, the symbol tuning and you know all this kind of like iconic stuff that you know from from like early Detroit recordings. Um, the Din Sync, uh, on the other hand, is uh, it's a, it's a Roland uh, speciality. Um, when Roland brought out the 606 and the th and the 303 that you can see here, I don't know if you can see it. If I point my finger out, can you see it? The 303, well, you can see it. Doesn't matter. Um, you you all know how a 303 looks. I I I guess um, it's this little silver box with the knobs on it, and you turn around on top. Um, so when this came out, MIDI was al was was already around. There were synthesizers that had that had MIDI uh, built in uh, in the 80s. But Roland somehow decided, uh, why don't we do our own format? You know, we know that kind of behavior from Apple and other companies nowadays. So why we make our own charger or we make our own operation system? And this is like uh, Roland decided, okay, we don't do a MIDI clock. We do DINSYNC, which is only used by Roland devices. So when I started to make music and I was like, I don't know, like 18, 19, and I came across the first uh, used uh, Roland uh, things, I would s I would plug in a MIDI uh, uh, jack because it's the same jack. It just doesn't work. So that's the fun part. Uh, and so I would plug in uh, a MIDI jack and would be, uh, try to sync it, and it just wouldn't work. And I mean, back then there was no internet. So you would need to know someone that can tell you why the fuck isn't, isn't it working. And I I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, started to make music in a quite a small uh, village in Styria, which is uh, in the countryside. And there were just no other people around that could tell me why the fuck isn't it working. So um, then later on, I discovered, uh, you know, other people. Ah, okay, you need to do this and this and that. So DinSync is something that you still have to do and still have to know um, um, uh, till today because all the Roland stuff, the 606, the 303, some of the the 505 and so on, the 909 takes MIDI, but uh, all these machines like run on thin sync. So we need a kind of sync box here, an extra box that will convert the MIDI sync into a thin sync. Otherwise, we couldn't use the 303. Um, so let's 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 play it again. I, I show you the 303 is also synced up. Play the whole thing. So the 303 is also working on its own uh, sequencer. Sounds good with the bass line. that sound um, since 88 um, so and uh, the other drum machine I use here is a Korg Electribe first model and uh, if you look for a still quite affordable drum machine that you can uh, that you use live this is a really really powerful amazing drum machine and um, maybe like two years ago or something you can find this for like a hundred euros uh, now they go up um, as everything uh, funny and but it's really cool because this is a machine that you can switch into program mode while you play. That means you can have a pattern going, and while you add it, you can just like, you know, like add little little instruments. You can also um, um, you can also really drastically change change the sound. Maybe we try that. <laughs> Thank you. 
I make this little percussion sound. And the cool thing is, it has like built-in effects. And you can... It's... It kind of sounds like a synthesizer. This is what I like. And if we go back, for example, if we switch back, if we switch back to the program, it will come up the way you had it before because we work with program changes. That means on a MIDI protocol, you can tell uh, the, the drum machine for the next song what sound should come up again and which pattern you're going to use. So that way, when, you cha when we change from one song to the next, I get the MIDI change from the MPC, so I don't have to go to the drum machine and or to a sheet of paper and be like, okay, this is track number five, so we're gonna need uh, drum patterns like this. So we're gonna op we will all prepare the program changes uh, uh, in the studio, so the drum machines, except of the Nano 9, this doesn't do uh, program changes, but for, uh, for, for example, this one is switching to the right pattern, which is extremely good because, again, you don't have to think about uh, technical stuff. You can just... Um, concentrate on music. Any questions about sync or, or, or stuff like this? Anything you always wanted to know about syncing up your stuff or, or so? Okay, that's good. Uh, program change is a, for those who don't know, it's a very, very simple MIDI command that just says, you know, I have a basically a number here in the MPC from zero or from one to 127, which is the range of MIDI information that you can send, which is, you know, from a modern perspective very limited and when I turn a certain number I see that the electrode patterns are changing and then it's like okay this is pattern B6 B10 which um, on the MPC would be like program change 74 for whatever reason so program changes if you work with hardware and machines that have program change it's quite useful because yes. you can kind of you don't need a sheet of paper that you know, where you write down which song has which pattern it's you know it's very basic MIDI stuff but I'm just saying it to for for those who might have not heard of that, very useful for live, but you have to try it out before because some old machines that can do program change don't like it. So like the Juno 106, for example, uh, or, or the Oberheim Matrix 1000, uh, that we have one Matrix 1000 rack polyphonic synthesizer can receive program change, but it then suddenly has a delay. It's a, like a MIDI glitch, so just something to be aware of to try out before you kind of set up a this routine, but a useful function with MIDI. And I also use I also use a little mixer here. It's the most cheapest mixer and smallest mixer I could find. It's a Beringer, what's it called? Uh, I don't know what's it what it's called. It's like an effect mixer. I don't use the effects on it, but uh, it has just the right amounts of inputs that I uh, that I can use, and I just use it to mix my uh, my 909, uh, the, the the drum machine, the the 303 goes into his mixer because I like it that I can twiddle the frequency while he's twiddling the effects because it's hard to do both at the same time. So we kind of like cross modulate a little bit. And um, and all the rest is just like uh, pedal gear. I love pedal gear. I would take more pedals because I like the idea of a device that I can just do one thing. I just, I think this is just a really uh, intriguing, intriguing thing. And uh, so I use like a different, a little different pedals. Uh, I use also the RE20 uh, space, um, echo for, yeah, for like, um, can you play for the, for the, for like for the here, clap stuff. Also the reason you can tap it, I love it to tap it, you don't have to dial in any number or something. You just hit it a couple of times and it will be in, in, in rhythm. Love it. Um, the other thing that I have here is uh, an interesting Alesis uh, um, multi-effect uh, unit that I got once on a kind of uh, what called what's it called kind of endorsement thing. Like they were sending out a couple of doors and like, okay, here, come on, uh, try this if it's any good. It's not really good, to be honest. It's I I I, I wouldn't I would have bought it, but they gave it to me at at, at the end because it I think it never came out. Um, officially, I haven't seen it around. Um, maybe I've seen one other uh, thing like this. It's called 
um, uh, indigo or something like this. I don't know, but it's it's just like a matrix uh, effect where you can uh, switch through a couple of multi effects like a vocoder or Fermat shifter or a pitch shifter, and you have three little controls that almost do nothing. I like that because there's nothing you can you can do wrong. So um, it's a and 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 the other thing is which I think is really important. I like the pedals to be in stereo because um, a lot of samples that we use on the MPC are sampled in stereo. If all the drums and all the effects would come just in mono, it's really hard to achieve a kind of like a mix that kind of goes together. Because if all the drum machines, of course, they are all mono, uh, if they would all come in mono in the middle and all the sample drums would be on the side, I think it's really hard to achieve a kind of like nice. I, I like them to melt together, so I try to have a, an effect chain that is done in stereo. And um, so I was specifically looking for small pedals that are uh, that are able to do uh, real stereo. I use this uh, TC Electronics uh, Hall of Fame, this small one. You might maybe guitar players uh, know it. Beautiful, has a spring reverb, a fake spring reverb, and a plate on it. Uh, that's all I need. It's small, it's cheap, and it's in stereo, and it has only f two knobs that you turn. And then I, it's it, and then I use this Demora um, Roland semi um, uh, modular effect module thing. Yeah? I think it was it was I think it was it was it was a kind of something that you can put in a Döpfer system or so on. Yeah, these are these Roland I think oh. from this uh, Aira series. Aira uh, series, yes, this was uh, it and is. it's it's a digital echo bait or delay basically but the the interesting factor for us was that um, this blue box here is a Kenton Pro Solo which we use to control it's multiple things actually so we it syncs the MIDI from the MPC to DIN sync to the TB303 it has a CV gate which is the say which is which is for those who don't know it's like a vintage MIDI so a CV is the the pitch of of the MC202 bass synthesizer, so the, the pitch of the note and gate is just a signal that says on, off, on, off, on, off, so like pressing a key. It's kind of the historic version of MIDI. It very can simple historic version. Very <laughs> simple historic version. It just goes on and plays the keys. This we use for the 202 and um, the good thing about this little Kenton box, and it's not cheap, um, or it used to be at least, I don't know, um, it's it's uh, it has an extra output which here is called uh, AUX one and it um, it can send uh, an analog clock which is kind of like um, basically uh, like a tiny pulse of I think sixteen notes or maybe faster but it's a it's a standardized um, value that uh, is changes depending on the tempo of the MPC so this little Roland uh, digital delay is um, you can program it via an iPad, I think, and uh, or via phone. So you can kind of change functions and say, like, I want to have this spare input there. That's why it's semi-modular to receive uh, this old analog clock. And um, because uh, we we have these tap echoes, the, the space echoes, which are, you know, very simple and very straightforward. And the cool thing about that echo is not, you know, it sounds pretty okay. It's not the craziest echo out there but it's it's uh it's um all of our MIDI outputs everything's pretty much used up so we're kind of maxed out on the connectivity between my devices Patrick's devices going back and forth and this little spare output on the Kenton can sync that um maybe we should that maybe echo we should, maybe we should yeah, uh, let's maybe try we should it. see uh, how it how it sounds okay, maybe. Um, I use um on the mixer here, I just have one aux channel that I use for, as you heard, for the for the delay. But I wanted to send all the information that I have here from the beats, I wanted to send it into this effect chain. So what I thought is cool uh, that I use the headphone output, which I don't use for playing live, to send uh, all the mix extra to an effect chain and I have an extra uh, channel here on the mixer where just the effect is coming. So I have like a dry signal on the mixer and I have an effect signal. So if I if I put this if I put the, the, the headphone up, I will take the signal from my small mixer and feed it through this little thing here which has a filter and a delay. Just leave it on. And I have a kind of 
beat stops. I can have like a little kind of sampling, uh, on the spot sampling thing, and I can be like. one knob I can send like a, a second mix of, of, uh, of things of, of, uh, of drum drum tracks or whatever I can I just can just send them to the I can send them to the effect uh, 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 chain which is nice because um, if you if, if you just work with the patterns you can kind of like build up a second layer with just using the delay. You can just like freeze a certain drum loop in the in, in, in at the moment, switch to a next pattern and just like freeze that little loop and bring it in later. And, and you have and you even have a, a filter on this one. So it's a it's a w it's again it's a one two uh, uh, knob operation. And I think and I think this is really important that you just have like limited kind of uh, uh, abilities when, when, when you play live and you don't need to have 300 different settings uh, uh, for, for each track. So, so the effect chain is, is, is really switched, switched uh, uh, one after the other. So first is the delay, then comes the reverb, and then comes this little multi-effect, which has quirky little pitch shifting things that I sometimes use, sometimes not. And if I use them, I don't really know what's coming out. So it's a, it's a little bit of an of a, of a random uh, operation there, but uh, I, I kind of like it. Um, the other funny thing I have here, and this is really something for uh, for the nerds, um, is a little sampler, and it's from Akai, um, and it's called a phrase trainer. And the interesting thing is that it was originally made for uh, it's it's from the you looked at it, it's like from the late late 80s early 90s early 90s yeah it must be like i guess late 80s early 90s Le yeah. it's a 12 bit it's a 12 bit sampler and uh, it's called phrase trainer because it was marketed in the way that like for example if you are a musician you are a saxophone player and you want to play this lick and you want to play it back you could play into the sampler record the lick and then play it slowly because it has a time stretching, very, very bad 12 uh, bit time stretching uh, uh, thing on it. Maybe we can, we can demonstrate it. Yeah. So what, 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 what we do is, so we have more interactive things. We take the headphone output from the MPC uh, and I can sample uh, Sam's MPC into the into the uh, uh, into the phrase trainer, and then I can time stretch it. Maybe I, I so show you. So show all you how um, it works. the headphone output on the MPC, just to say that it has. Um, I have two outputs. Um, one stereo output for the like harmonic samples, which you'll hear in a second, and the other output for drum percussion samples, as you heard before. The main output of the MPC also goes out the same way through the headphone output. So that's the cable we use to feed the phrase trainer with them. Um, with these songs, with harmonic sample. So I'm gonna play this uh, organ sample and then Patrick will kind of use the phrase trainer. If it works, let's see if it works. Um, so it has a recording button. So what I do is like I press record and then I press loop. So we take out the original, that's the, that's the that's the loop I just made, and you can see. You have two modes, you can make a loop, or you can play through every bit of the recording, like this. Sounds freaky now, but if you combine it, uh, I have a little uh, um, hardware compressor uh, uh, underneath, and I compress it, and I use the side chain of the compressor. So if I have, like, for example, this, and I use, like, uh, let's say, like, uh, I use like a side chain and a kick and a and a, and a kick thing.
You can see that there's a little side chain thing going on. And I have a filter. So I can all the time grab some harmonic stuff from, from, from Sam, which is going on, and I can grab it, and like in the break, when he's putting out the harmonic stuff, or we prepare that we play the next song, uh, I, can, I can kind of, uh, you know, just like make this little loop, and can use it for like a delay thing, or for an extra harmonic thing, and uh, it's it's it sounds weird, but in the set it's it's quite it's quite useful and it sounds quite nice. And sometimes you could also do it with beats, and uh, it kind of adds a little bit of dirt uh, um, to the sam to the to the samples. And you don't really know what it does. It doesn't work every time, or it's very hard to control. It just kind of repeats stuff, and then it stops again. Then it comes. So it's a it's kind of our like a, it's a bit of a random thing. And at the same time, through the side chain. Um, basically four to the floor uh, that's triggered over the 909 it's it's kind of pulled down and so you can kind of grab uh, this kind of droney granular sounding thing uh, of like dirt and and also sync it again that it gets this pulse it's a you know very simple trick of course uh, to get stuff in time through sidechain but that's kind of like a little extra uh, dirt machine that and there's stuff as we were saying before like playing live sometimes it got like extremely loud or 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 a part of a song before kind of got stuck and Patrick didn't mute it and I started the next song and it actually doesn't fit harmonically but suddenly this phrase trainer would keep kind of playing and um, often that was kind of cool so it's kind of a bit of a random thing that we that you know that you can kind of control and not really um, as a little kind of extra layer it's a of bit a like flavor. A with like something yeah. with a teacher mix you bring yeah. in the next song kind of doesn't fit so yeah. well. So maybe we should uh, before we talk, you know, because we've talked, I guess, for an almost an hour. Uh, we Any should we should maybe play a, a this yeah, track we with can that. No, we play or we can play also play another one or maybe we can also talk a little bit about the kind of uh, sample treatment. We could play the uh, the, the the exo. You could explain yeah. sample sample choppings and so on. Any questions at this point about uh, about the setup? Uh, something you want to know more specifically um, about? How we trigger stuff together, how we sync it, anything, any? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Sure, why not? The bills? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
So now you heard the uh, yeah. Now you heard the phrase trainer. It gets it can get very, very loud if we um, you know it just happens. So if I fuck up, <laughs> you want it the subtext. I'm if it gets really loud, if I'm I not fuck up, so I'm not pointing any fingers. No, you know, no, no, no. But no. I don't have the phrase trainer, so no. Yeah. Just kidding. Well, that's kind of the the nice thing. It's like a, it's like this weird animal that just has a mind of its own, and it's a you know strange, traveling with pets, I shitty like kind it. of device that does yeah. cool stuff. So yeah. Thanks for the shitty device. <laughs> so, okay, so... Uh, <laughs> In a good um, way. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, some other thing that we maybe want to uh, demonstrate is uh, the way we treat samples. For example, um, Sam uh, is knows his way really good around the MPC, much better than I do. And, um, and we use a lot of uh, really corny, uh, sometimes not so interesting samples in the first place but we used to we, we used to chop them up and uh, kind of put a kind of random uh, aspect uh, to them and for a song that we did uh, on our on the record before our last record there was a song called exu and uh, maybe you can explain what we yeah. what we what we did to the sample there there's a really um, basic kind of sample chopping um, trick in a way maybe that uh, works quite well that actually um Patrick had showed me a few years ago that I wasn't entirely aware of in the MPC. The MPC has these two Q-Link faders that can uh, have a, that you can, you know, you have certain um, functions you can apply to them, like a cutoff filter, which is probably the main thing, and a funny kind of programming tool for if you work with longer samples, harmonic samples, is that um, this fader can be applied to what's called sample start. So when you step through, um, when you move the fader, the beginning of the sample moves. So um, basically, I was, I had this. Um, I can try to set it up. I had a very um, straight up kind of a. I didn't prepare this, you know, in a sense for a demonstration. So you gotta, you know, some things might work. 
or not. <laughs> so anyway, there's a sample. It's a chord or like s from I don't I don't even know where it's from anymore. And oh, thanks. We took the. Um, I don't think the chord was from there though. No? I, it doesn't matter. It was from it was from something from the 70s because uh, they sound kind of they have these you know nice warm sounding. Tw anyway, so you have this this harmonic layer, a longer sample, maybe like 30 seconds or so, or no, not that's too long for MPC. Yeah, 15 to 20 seconds maybe. It doesn't have so much memory, so you have to be kind of um, keep your sample lengths together. Anyway, so if you trigger, if you program like s a, a rhythm and then at the same time move the sample uh, start fader, uh, it you can kind of create random, you know, a random pattern in, in the chord changes of the original sample through this rhythm rhythmic kind of slicing, you know, with Ableton or all these softwares, that's it's 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 very uh, I would say nowadays probably you know more common than than it was with this machine. But yeah, so you can kind of step through. So I'll, I'll just tr try to play this this chopped sample. Yeah. So as you can hear, it it uh, I try to move the fader around to find good spots, and it's a very short fader, so. You don't always hit the spot again where you heard a good chop. You could also, you know, chop it by hand, which I do most of the times. But if by stepping through this sample, um, maybe I can. Maybe I'll find it. Yeah, I'll try to look for it. It's just the original sample would be. Yeah, let me just see. Here, okay. This is the original sample. It's not so bad. There are worse, we used worse, yeah. uh, 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 worse samples. Favorite part now? So it's you know pretty corny, but it has a nice warm sound. And that's kind of for me personally what I look for. Um, and then through this random kind of flipping around this fader and kind of stepping through the progression of this sample, um, a coincidental chord change happens. That's kind of the thing that Patrick had showed me a few years ago. So if you kind of if you don't really want to chop it up into like you know 16 samples and look for the chops, which you know I do 95% of the time anyway, then um, this pattern kind of uh, came about in a in a really fast way. But it's but it's faster to try like uh, three four times to find something on random than to actually chop up yeah. the thing that you have in mind because it never comes out the way you have it in mind. So have like three or four or five tries, you might come up with the even cooler version and uh you know and you can always be like ah, oh, no, that's not it okay let's try another one and so i think this time really I it kind of came up kind of on on random yeah it, it was totally random and and as i said the fader is so small and it's this is not able so you can't really edit an automation curve very precisely afterwards it's almost impossible in the mpc so you have to kind of try to record it and repeat it you know at least for these these are like eight bars. Um, I probably copied maybe like four bars or two bars and multiplied them. But just for these two bars, you have to kind of try to get the right point with this tiny fader. Yeah, so that's just a um, a very it's like a good a good cheap trick to flip a sample uh, that it sounds way more complicated than actually what you probably <laughs> did, w and and you get um, harmonic uh, uh, changes and combinations of parts of these sample that you probably wouldn't hear if you cut it apart by hand. So it also has like an improvisational touch to it. So yeah, this is what it sounds like. You know, kind of like uh, this. Um, I don't know what uh, what you call it. Uh, this kind of, you know, sample uh, fidgety sample uh, house stuff. Maybe from like I guess the late nineties or so. Um, but yeah, it's a nice coincidental movement. It has kind of a it has kind of a warm uh, harmonic change to it that is way less corny than the original sample actually is, and that's kind of the for me the thing that it it shouldn't you know be quite as cheesy as this as this original was. It, it doesn't sound anything like the original sample, although it's entirely made of that sample. Yeah, yeah. Let's play the track.
So uh, just that was kind of, as you heard, uh, more of a sample collage. So the chord samples, um, a lot of drum samples, percussion samples. Here there's also this piano sound, which is like from an... Yeah. He really came up with this piano uh, line. Incredible piano <laughs> line sound. <laughs> It's and we recorded it on this Yamaha 90s stage, kind of a master keyboard from uh, Patrick's in the studio. And uh, I, you know, I would the Mini Log is a fine synthesizer, but it's not the greatest synthesizer to play, at least for me, because I have fairly long fingers. And I don't know, I, I like it, but I don't really feel super comfortable playing with it. Like in 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 this stuff is not particularly hard in a classical sense, but I wish I had like I could play this. I had like a piano sound, you know, to play this, or like a proper small keyboard with good keys just so you have a, a better feeling um, so with this track for example we played I played the piano in the studio we recorded it we recorded this track entirely onto tape without the computer like it's an, a, a total live jam onto multi-track tape later on from live we re-recorded the piano kind of a sample of it into the MPC so that's kind of a you know a straightforward sample of a uh, of the recording um but i think we also have the midi notes so we could also play yeah. it we could also play it in 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 the mini log if we want the mini log played it before yeah yes. but it's it's um yeah that's one of the limitations i actually would i would like to have you know um uh, just like space wise maybe like a extra midi module or something that had um this sound although it, you know it's a it's a simple kind of chord change but it would be nicer it would be a nicer feeling to kind of properly play that piano that's an, like one of the downsides where I would think I would be cool if like the mini log just had a you know more or less mediocre di diggy kind of 90s keyboard on it um, doesn't so yeah so that's also just uh, reintegrated which um, we sometimes do depending on how much overdubbing we did in the studio kind of uh, outside of this technical setup then we kind of have to resample those parts into the MPC as a as a backing track kind of. Uh yeah, because we uh, can take the Juno on the road and stuff like this, so there needs to be some kind of um, uh, re sampling of the stuff that we recorded, yes. Um, well, um, any, I don't know, any, any questions from you guys? You've been really quiet out there, I have to say, which is okay, but you know, like sitting audience, quiet sitting audience. Any questions? Don't be shy. You know, we're going we to go down for beer later on. Then you can really kind of like come with all your questions to us. But, you know, maybe some, please. I would say, um, you know, in the MPC, you can only level stuff, and you have a high pass and a low pass filter, which is a pretty, pretty powerful tool, considering it's a simple kind of machine um, from a today's perspective. Um, most of the time, you know, it's like all the samples, um, or the way I work with MPC, and the way probably most people work with a hardware sampler that has a high pass filter. You know, high pass filter cuts away the bass, so. That's really important to get rid of all like the the mud, especially with vinyl samples. They're always really you know there's a lot of rumble and bass and so that th from experience you know I, you kind of clean up you try to clean up as much as possible without losing the sound. Um, and when we play you know I I don't have um, total control. I have like these two outputs as I said. I have a harmonic kind of melody channel on the mixer and the percussion channel from the MPC. I can't really change the volume while it's playing, which is pretty, you know, it would be great if you could like, if, if um, this specific MPC had like, you know, um, an easier overview to like change the volume really quick while you're playing. It's a bit more complicated, but that's just the way it is. Um, and you have to kind of work with it. But so yeah, we try to level stuff from, from playing at different places and like, okay, yeah, that, that piano sample is too loud or it's too quiet. And the next, next gig or during sound check, you kind of change it, you save it into the setting and, and then you kind of keep adapting. There's no EQ, you know, uh, on the MPC. So I would say most of the time it just works out. The MPC 1000, that's why I work with it, has a good sound to it. Um, not particularly clean. It distorts easily if the sounds are um, very bass heavy or have a very loud um, digital volume inside the sample. 
um, but you can kind of play with it. And I think it's kind of cool that it, it makes um, certain things a bit more fat, but that can also be dangerous again if it's too fat. Um, yeah, so in here it's basically leveling, or if it's really complicated, you can, of course, take the sample, you know, load it into the computer, switch it around for like live, s uh, live terms. Um, we've sometimes done it, but actually not very often because it kind of just works out. You know, it's most of the time, like 90% of the time, it's too much bass from samples, and we have a lot of bass with these two machines, so it's more of a question of having less bass on the other sounds. Um, and I don't know, I think MPC is kind of like tape. It, it, it kind of works out most of the times. If you have good samples from, you know, I don't know, warm sounding records that are, they're never too harsh. You know, they're never gonna be this super digital, clean, full frequency kind of sound. They'll be more warm and it's, I guess it's more about your yeah, bass and leveling and it has to, it has to work, you know, it, 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 there's no option. So it just, I don't and have more channels. I don't have a multiband EQ, you know, so it just has to kind of work and it, it does, you know. And then it's also, uh, um, the question like how you want how you want your setup to sound when you play live starts when you select your gear in the stu in the studio for setup because like Sam said like the ba we, we we know like the the lower part like the bass is here we just grab it and this makes the bass I know how the 909 sounds I know how this sounds and so on so we try to avoid uh, bringing machines or equipment that covers the kind of same frequency and they all play on top of each other so we kind of it's it's pretty clear like I do the beats here and I do the stuff and he does the melody so it's kind of like the way you, you you put it it's it's the way you can play it but of course um, like all the sounds on the 909 I have like little volume uh, switches here so I we kind of mix it while we go um, there's nobody sitting out there and at the end we deliver just a stereo signal to the to the system so we have to do the mix the balance why we do it live you have to hope for, hope for the best kind of you have to hope for the best i mean if the monitoring is good that helps um sometimes there is a sound guy also there like when we play at festivals most of the time there is a sound guy there and when we do a sound check we talk to the guy we say like okay hey man listen uh we mix everything on stage if we hear something like if the highs are too high just you know just twiddle around just like help us out like we trust you, you know. Turn up the bass a little bit if we if we miss a little bit on the bass. So, but if if, if it's if it's not if it's not the case, if it's just a club and we plug into the system, we walk around for the sound check and then we just hope for the best. Sometimes, like during the set, sometimes I go out on the dance floor for the first track, listen, come back, and then you know you you, you just you just find your way in. Sometimes it sounds not so good for the first track, and then you get a little better, and by the end of this. Of by the end of the of the set, um, you have a feel for the room. You have a feel for the response of the room, and also uh, it always will sound different when there are people in the room than when you do the sound check. When you do the sound check, it can sound like you be like, Whoa. and then the room fills up, and it's like it gets nice and warm, and you know it gets uh, 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 it it just it just gets the sound that that you're looking for. But uh, mixing it up on stage without actually hearing the sound can be tricky. We played once in Vienna at, uh, at a quite big venue and there were a lot of other bands on stage and we and our setter was by far the smallest setup. So we said, okay, you know, like we have a lot of changeovers to do. You know what? We play where the sound guy is. So they, they gave us a little table and we played on the opposite side of the stage and we actually played, we heard what the people were hearing on the dance floor. We played into this, we played with the system. So we we're actually playing into the sound system or we sometimes play on uh, like kind of like reggae sound system style where you play towards the sound system and this is the best this is these are always the best situations because you hear what the people what the dancers on the on, on the dance floor what they hear and we actually made a recording from this vienna gig where we had this really nice kind of uh, 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 position and uh, and Usually I'm very critical with live uh, um, recordings, but they might sound good in the club, but then you listen back at home and the kick is too loud, or it's like, it's, it's never really, it, it kind of never really feels right for me, a live recording. And, uh, but this time the live recording came out so nice, we, you could just take it and it kind of, kind of almost sounded out like on the record. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a question of how good the workspace is for you while you mix your track um, yeah. on the spot. And uh, 
and and uh, also we we you know you can because these are all machines and um, as I said with the MPC there's certain limitations to to like dive into each sample while you're playing because it's not particularly built for that actually um, but with everything else you know Patrick can all control all can control all of his devices the volume of them at least and uh, and we have you know simple EQ on the Pioneer for like the fa final kind of you know master EQing in if it's just too many mids you know at least you can turn down the mids somewhere or the bass or turn up the treble and um, so we can kind of always react and that's what we do all the time anyway you know we don't really um, we don't have arrangements so m m a lot of the arranging is you know parts of the patterns melodies uh, as you heard but also kind of shifting volumes you know if we, if we played longer for like an hour or more than you know you have these long phases of like blending something in and and if you did a sound check before and if you maybe know the venue or you know also just a matter of luck then you kind of think okay I'm, I'm gonna crank this up more and more and I think you know I think it kind of feels good and the monitor and the sound system kind of um, react plus people in the room are always you know uh, kind of even out the sound uh, uh, way more than in an empty room um, so yeah so you we can kind of dynamically react to to like atmosphere uh, uh, vibe and uh, and also yeah problems if, if it's you know sometimes I also say like hey Patrick the Trace trainer is getting like way out of hand, even though it's fun. Sometimes, sometimes he he never, might he <laughs> and I mean I also I, I maybe the phrase trainer is the wrong example or like the three or three whatever. I mean all these things, actually all these things sound good. So actually I have to I have to eat my words. Um, what I wanted to say before is um, and this is not to preach like gear love because it's just a coincidence that we use these things. You know, if we would start now, we might have completely different gear. I don't think it's, you know, you don't need a 909. It's just Patrick has one. You know, I have a 202. I have an MPC. I might have, a, you know, the new MPC live, whatever. I might work with that. So I think that's not the important factor. The important factor is, though, I from for us at least, is um, whatever equipment you have, you know, it might be like a shitty kind of thing, uh, like shitty in, in quotation marks, like the phrase trainer, which is really dope and very special. But it's not a particularly, like, in technical terms, a good sounding device, but it has a very special sound, and that's why we use it. You know, no, you keep on hitting <laughs> on the phrase <laughs> no, trainer. No, it's just a good <laughs> example. It's just a good example, <laughs> but uh, I I love it, and it's it's totally like necessary for us. But um, just I'm just gonna finish my sentence. Just one one second. Uh, so, lucky for us in a way, um, these these kind of the main core devices kind of sound always sound good. It sounds corny, you know, and uh, maybe a bit you know arrogant concerning each machine but from my experience sampling into an MPC and playing it out with the direct out into a mixer sounds good most of the time it sounds more like a record it doesn't sound like a thin you know sound card kind of cheap mp3 kind of you know badly converted mp3 sound that often happens and um, that's why I work with the MPC it's it's kind of limited but it has it has like this this record sound to it and the 909 as well and the 202 so the whole mixing aspect just to finish this up is um it's a bit easier if the devices sound good by themselves and they kind of, you know, stylistically and the way we use them, they kind of work together. You know, we, the music we make, we make them with these machines so they influence what they sound like together and so the mix kind of is influenced by all the machines and it's, it's like this circle that keeps going on. Just to, just to say that, sorry that I didn't want to interrupt you. Your question. Ah, okay, sorry, I, t I spoke too long. Yep. Sasha? Oh, okay. Maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it so romantic, <laughs> but um, of course, like uh, we were talking about, like if I would change the nine, uh, the nine nine, and put an eight oh eight to it and program the same rhythm, it would. I know, I know. It would be. I mean, it would uh, of course like this. It would be a totally different story. Like if you replay the whole se a set on an eight oh eight, or if you would use maybe uh, just like no no phrase trainer or like a, a more kind of like nicely sounding reverb of course it would it would it would change the the whole outfit of the music it would maybe change a little bit the the the, the, the picture but of course the phrase trainer is a uh, is our third is our third uh, is our third member for sure yeah <laughs> and 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 one other thing was in interesting because when we started to play i think we what, what what synthesizers did we start when we started out i think we took a juno uh, i had an alpha. alpha roland alpha juno, juno, juno uh, kind uh, of alpha. a 80s uh, 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 <laughs> 
ähm, analog synth. Uh and we took that one and put the first yeah. mix and it had actually it, it, it was sitting really nicely in the mix. And when yeah. Sam got the cork, uh, the mini lock, I think we really had a hard time in the beginning to fit the synth then because it was kind of like Yeah, it no, it, w it, w it was it was it was harder to fit that yeah. into the setup than actually the old school synth because the old school synth is what we were hearing in our head and it was what fitted to the to the rest of the sound. So the new kind of synth came in, and the new I guy is always you know like uh <laughs> <laughs> it has to fit in, and uh, so we really had to fiddle around a little bit with the cork to make it s to make it fit to the to, to the overall sound. Yes, yeah, I mean I'm I for example I'm I like as I said before, you know, the mini log in itself is a great synthesizer regarding what it is and what it costs and, and the way it's built and I would I wouldn't, you know, criticize it in that sense, but I definitely have like a harder time working with this than for example with um this Alpha Uno that we had, even though the controls are kind of complicated on it or or like the Juno 106 from the eighties, um which I have at home and I, I know like inside out and I would rather take that one. But it's it's huge, you know. It's heavy. You have another um, thing to carry to fly with, so you know I I that adds up to like costs and 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 just like physical transportation problems. Um, so the mini log is like a compromise, but that's definitely like um, you know the I I would I probably would never get rid of the MPC 1000 or the 202 for me uh, because they just do what they do very very good and they're kind of small and they're very reliable. I could probably if I if an if a different small compact polyphonic analog uh, synth came out that I could afford and, and all these things that had certain factors, I would probably just, you know, try at least try it out. So that's um it's uh, certain things might be as essential, but in the way you have to kind of you know, something might break or get stolen or whatever, you never know. So you have to then say, okay, well maybe it's time to change the bass synth now or to change Replace the drum machine with something else. Yeah, as long as we got them, you know. Uh, actually, I was I was I was joking once that I want to replace the original 909 with this tiny reissue. You might maybe know it was really threading to end the project. Yeah, that was a deal breaker. So, uh, but because um, he was saying like, yeah, it's so heavy, and it is heavy. You know, it's no, massive. it's actually not so. But heavy. but it's it's heavy in modern <laughs> terms. You know what I mean? In modern electronic music, it's kind of a weighty thing, and it's you know, it's in a, it's the 909, and it's big, and it's a backpack full of drum machine. And he was saying like, maybe we use a smaller one. And I said like, yeah. You know they're fine. They're fine for what they are, and especially regarding the cost. As I said, it's not uh, meant to say that vintage stuff is better. There's really good stuff, especially for the price. Um, but it's but I said like it's a romantic yeah. mojo around. And it, this yeah. one just sounds really good. That's the that's what it comes down to. If this were from you know 2019 and it would sound exactly the way this one sounds, then I would say, and it's this big, you know, uh, uh, and then I would of course say like, hey, of course we're gonna take a 500 euro drum machine along that sounds really really good, but um, For this sound, I always said like, yeah, if one, you know, as long as one doesn't come along that does exactly this kind of mojo, that uh, especially each 909 sounds kind of different. Patrick's sounds really good in my ears, and I think in his. And so, uh, as long as that's the fact, you you kind of keep it, you know, if if nothing better I comes. I think along. we had a another so question back there. Uh, yeah. No, no, I, I do improvise. It really depends. Like um, the mini log, uh, as I said, it has kind of smaller keys. They're way better than like the microcore keys. If you know the microcore from back then, that was really tiny. Um, I definitely like play around. You know, when we play a full set and it gets kind of you know, you get kind of deep into it. Then I I, I jam around with the I, and I know the harmonies for each track. I'm terrible at remembering harmonies, so I have a little piece of tape on my mixer that says track one G minor, track two C minor. Track three D minor, you know. Track four E minor, D minor, A minor seven, G minor seven. Just because, um, you know, we do all kinds of projects and we don't play every weekend nonstop. So it's not like a touring band where you just kind of know the whole life set. And you know every. I mean, we know the feeling of each track kind of, and we improvise it anyway. But I'm I don't think about like, oh yeah, this one track it's it's an A minor. I mean, I can you know you can hear it and you'll find it at some point, but. Yeah, I, I write it down just out of like comfort, you know, that you just don't have to think about it. Uh, if it's if you're not sure, say, hey, let's skip that track, and then you're not sure anymore. Oh, which track was in G minor and which one it was in B minor? And then also sometimes we yeah. we, we we change our our uh, our kind of like our set. Um, yeah. Sometimes we just play it like say, like, okay, let's start with this track or let's start with that one, or maybe in the studio we just just like erase the patterns. Uh, play some other patterns, and the interesting thing, for example, with the with the Roland is there are two ways to uh, get the patterns in. 
you sit down and you program them in again, you know, the way you had it. Sometimes you listen to the record, <laughs> you be like, okay, what was it? okay, so we had this, you play it in, or you can save it onto tape. Of course, now we don't use tape anymore, we use the uh, iPhone um, to, with an audio signal, it has to play it out, like with the, like with the modem or something. It goes, so it goes like, it's like a bit sound. You know, like there's like a little loading sound, so you can, we could actually from the, from a, from a audio device kind of play in new patterns in it, but we rarely ever do it, we would just like, have a set of, of 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 songs that we play. I mean, we have more songs on records that we that that we bring out. So we make the selection. Let's say for the next uh, gig or the next two gigs, we say like, okay, we play here and there. Let's play this and this and this song. And we have to of course pre prepare this uh, in the studio before. And uh, harmonically, of course, the stuff is fitting together because when we made the tracks in the studio, we kind of, you know kept the samples, kept this, keep this, uh, keep the MIDI notes for the bass line. So we've, every time we, 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 we bring a track back in or a new track into our setup, we kind of build it up in the same way that we used to do it in the studio when, when, when we recorded it or played it in in the first place. Wha and then also, also uh, another thing is, did you didn't show uh, oh Sam? Yeah. Sam, is playing, <laughs> Sam is playing harmonica. Just and keep on plugging and the it camera. It also and it also came and it also comes down to a practical joke that we had because when we played this this terrible terrible gig, our terrible not so terrible, it but wasn't our not so good gig first gig, we were play he uh, he, he was he was playing the Juno and we had this kind of dub thing going and it was a really loud monitor and do you know an artist called uh, Augustus Pablo? That's a dub reggae artist from the he, he 70s. Was a, he was a producer, uh, yeah. a Jamaican uh, a producer who made this uh, Melodica famous because I think um, back then, if I remember correctly, I think in, ja in Jamaica, um, because it was so cheap, I think kind of school children uh, learned playing kind of piano or keys on a Melodica. And uh, Augustus Pablo was like the first guy to um, use it in dub music, like reggae and dub tracks. And there's this legendary record of Augustus Pablo um, and King Tubby, who is like one of the dub, you know, innovators uh, in Jamaican record reggae producers. And it's actually it's kind of a silly instrument, you know. It's kind of it has a bit of a, you know, in in a, in a I mean it in a nice way. It has kind of a stupid sound in a really nice way, especially with echo. It has kind of a flavor to it, and I and I think it's kind of. Um, it's uh, it sounds good, especially for reggae music or for reggae influenced music, and it's also a bit of a stupid thing to play because you have this, you know, you have you're standing here and you have these electronic machines and, and you, you have, have something in your mouth. You have actually. this pipe in your mouth and it looks kind of awkward and it's just this uh, uh, funny plastic kind of thing that has a bit of a yeah, as I said, a silly sound, but um, but it's a it's a it's kind of for us it's a bit of a joke. Um, not 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 joking about this music culture. I'm I'm very like dedicated dub fan, and I think Augustus Pablo is one of the greatest. So that has nothing to do with that. But it's kind of a stylistic, you know. Uh, it's not very cool. And um, although I think it sounds cool, but it's it's not the coolest instrument. It's not like playing, you know, the 303 or I, I don't know whatever like an electric Fresh guitar. Train or yeah, or this is it's a it's a it's a kids. It's like a s simple kids instrument and. Um, but for us, we use it, um, you know, s in a s seriously kind of for um, certain flavors. We can try that out maybe with a the track. Then and and the thing is, like when the first time we played, I wanted I wanted Sam. We didn't have the we didn't have the melodica with us back then. But I wanted him to play a solo in a Augustus Pablo style because we both know Augustus Pablo. So it's like it's a really loud monitoring, and we're standing on stage quite far, uh, uh, like pl quite far from each other because that's another thing we had to realize. The closer you stay together, the better you can play. Sometimes on festival stages, we played somewhere, I can remember, we had uh, a stage when he was standing there and I was standing there and we kind of like had to shout at each other, horrible situation. So in this case, I, was I wanted him to make like an Augustus Pablo style solo and I scream at him, Augustus Pablo, Augustus Pablo, and he's like, has no idea. I was like, who? Yeah, who is it? No idea. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear him. What I'm talking about. And screaming, I was like, "Come on, play some Augustus Pablo." And then, ba and, and, and then back after the gig, when we thought about it, I was like, "Hey, man, we should take a melodica because I was screaming Augustus Pablo." And now, as a practical joke, we always take the uh, melodica with us because it kind of reminds us uh, uh, about our first gig and how. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's uh, uh, and it's an interesting, you know, it's like the phrase trainer. It has a. I don't use it very often. It depends kind of on the track we play, but. Uh, 
and I play very you know simple kind of just uh, phrases and um, to your question before about improvising which is also like with the melodica and the mini log is um you know harmonically speaking these tracks aren't very complicated obviously like like a lot of electronic music doesn't have the most freaked out you know uh, um, harmonies uh, but um so yeah I, I definitely like improvise harmonically on top of the tracks also depending on the mood like sometimes um because we can control it sometimes the tra the the gigs are more like beat driven more um let's say uh, you know monotonous kind of in in a in a more more groove based uh, more atmospheric sometimes they get more melodious and more kind of harmonically it, it depends like how the vibe is and how i don't know i'm i guess i'm feeling and uh but so yeah on each track um we know the harmonic structure or uh, specifically i know it and so i can definitely like play stuff on top of it and add layers we don't really have uh, you know themes or melodies or parts or, or song parts you know that you say that's the that's the line i always play with this song it it that is um it's kind of more, uh, I don't know, maybe like atmospheric noodling on top, you know, and it's not really the, it's more of a, a flavor. And the melodica is um, kind of a, a layer of sound that kind of adds adds some depth to it. Um, as I said before, you know, I, it's, 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 a, it's a funny instrument, but of course it's a serious thing that we use it, but it's also, you know, it also is a funny instrument, so it has like this ambivalence to it. And, uh, and you can just kind of improvise and send it into some echo and that has a, you know, should we play last? You know, we should. We yeah. sh maybe we should play uh, "Tired Wire" last track. Yeah. Where I love, I love the track. It's from our first. Um, it's from the yeah. first album, and it's one of the few tracks that we still play from the first album, because um, I don't know. We really like the track, and it's a track where you always play uh, melodica. So maybe you can have us give us a little bit of your melodica skills here, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, I guess because uh, time we is pretty take much it up. maybe downstairs to the beer. Yeah, if you we can, oh. we should. Uh, we we are around. So if yeah. you if if you have some questions still, and also um, we're playing tomorrow at eight o'clock. Yeah. Genau bei Hallo Montag diesmal am Mittwoch. Und ähm, ja, wir spielen unser Set und ich hoffe, ihr kommt alle und bringt alle eure Familie und viele Freunde mit. Ja? Please. Works works both ways. I mean, we love to work on a on a on a on the mixer, um, on the hardware mixer. We we hardly, um, as I said, we maybe do a little bit in the computer, but we use we really use the mixer as an instrument. Um, we use a lot of uh, um, analog effects like tape effects and so on in the studio that we obviously can't take on the road. But um, I think we're mostly influenced by the Jamaican dub culture, by the way to use the studio as an instrument because um, for us what's running at the moment is just the, the, the base material and we try to make uh, an arrangement out of that, out of bringing things in really quiet, like really taking the song down to, uh, to the melodic uh, uh, things and, 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 and I always think the best gigs that we play is when we have these kind of stretches of music without the beats, when there are like kind of references, uh, melodic dub reggae uh, references coming in. And um, um, and I, th I just think, as you said, the, 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 the arrangement happens between, uh, in the interaction, you know, I, I know what he's doing and I could be like, oh, that would be nice without a kick and I bring down the kick and he's like, okay, he takes down the kick, maybe I should play a little longer. So it's a kind of like, uh, it's a kind of like interaction and if there is a party going on and this is quite like as we said it's 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 a different situation now for you folks sitting down like checking us out <laughs> like this but if like is the if there's a party going on and we, we we play a little bit more straight on the beat a little bit we, we write it maybe a little more then uh of course there's much more interaction there's like shouting and there yeah. is like you know I, I i just go to the mpc and he t takes down my beat stuff like this so you know, the more we get into it, and the more the people are into it, the more active uh, we get. Now this was the kind of uh, lecture version, maybe, yeah. for you guys. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of, you know, yeah. we, we when we play live, and as I said, it's we are not, you know, uh, we, we're not a concert band, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, it's not so nothing to like say, oh okay, one hour, okay, cool, we look at this. You know, it has to be either a really dark place, or like an ambience floor, or, or in a club, and what what to what you I think what you also um, w asked is um, like we we do these very dubby transitions you know it's obviously because we like it it's also you know in a very um, if you put it very rationally it's a good tool you know echo is it's just that's the way it is in recording technical you know history and culture echoes are just a good and delays are just an uh, uh, you know for us it comes from the dub culture but besides all that it's just a good way to like get stuff going from one place without somehow stumbling into it and we actually sometimes talk about it like regarding the studio album uh, like production versus live um, part is uh, we sometimes uh, f we have these very like now with this track it's very very blended very kind of you know dreamy in a way we also when we play in a club we say like hey we have to like get every all these get rid of all these echoes now kind of just get it cleaned up and, and dry and then the drums come through in the bass and it gets more kind of um you get just yeah, just drier, sparser kind of elements that punch more in a way, and uh, and 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 not always dub the whole time. You know, now we kind of, uh, you know, uh, as Patrick said, in this situation we play differently in a club. It's a romantic, the romantic, yeah, the romantic uh, version. version. Yeah. 
for <laughs> for for a seated audience. Uh, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, so it really depends. And sometimes, as you said, um, if something, for example, we say, "Hey, Patrick did some some you know glitchy loops with with his devices, and it it, it got maybe a bit acidy or or drier," then we say, "Like, hey, we should actually maybe work on a track." the next time and not make everything so dubby, you know. We, we also try that the same way we kind of work on this whole echo delay thing a lot as a, as a, s as a tool for our artistic kind of expression. At the same time, we have to kind of, you know, kind of be aware ourselves to say like, hey, we can't dub all the time. You know, we have to like um, keep this stuff out for certain periods as well because le leaving all these echoes away is also an uh, effect and, and also in the studio, you know, for some tracks as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the ideal exactly. the ideal situation maybe when when we play live sometimes the ideal situation for me is when the track is running and Sam is doing his thing I sometimes really like just like step back, uh, uh, you know, like for for a minute and just like listen what he's doing and not touching any knob or trying any new brr brr, you know like sometimes I really just like step back and listen what what, what what's going on and kind of like take 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 me out of it because you know the thing is running yeah. it's okay you know you don't need to break it down or you don't need to you know do something every other minute or so so yeah. to be in the in the in the positive uh, uh, situation that can be like okay whatever i do i just can do like this and there's something else there's something else going on yeah you have uh, to kind of force yourself uh, regarding this whole like hardware setup you have to also force yourself not to touch stuff you know now we're obviously like touching stuff and i guess maybe also trying to show you people you know what what can happen but we we have over the years we try to like remind each other to say like hey this is a good part let's just you know let's just write it like out. a record just let it ride because you don't always have to put in a filter or a sample or an echo or or play a melody because actually it's it's something has built up and we want to keep this energy shifting you know and, and just like touch something very gently and and not kind of always go all over the top and super dreamy and you know and letting uh, letting things if if they develop right in a right direction just let them roll it's a, it's a thing you kind of constantly have to like force yourself to be aware of because you forget about it because it's cool to like filter a bass and it's fun to use an echo but actually you the best thing is uh, uh, is if yeah if also patrick he said like hey like let's just ride this you know and i'm like yeah yeah okay yeah, and you know and then we just try not to do anything and 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 often those are actually the best moments when we restrain ourselves a bit you know I think you had like a George Clinton question. said, "Funk is what you don't play." So, yeah. true. There was a question. Yeah, yeah. EQ yes. Um, I mean, I mean, it 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 sounds like it sounds, and we all know the sound. But of course, like with like so many extremely good sounding sample banks Let, let's let's put it that way a good sounding sample bank of an 808 most of the time sounds much better than when you plug in the 808 and just play the 808 because there's compression on it there's been numerous of people sitting there squeaking the low end making you know like making adjustments that just don't come out of the machine so um, in a world that it's filled with extremely well produced sound sounds on your disposal you just go like oh 808 okay Dum, ah, sounds amazing you really have to work with the original machines to get that maybe get that high fee feeling that everyone has on its fingertips you know because there is so much good stuff out there in the digital domain so you can't be lazy just being like hey we got a real 808 just let, let the 808 play and then you listen back to it and you'll be like but it doesn't sound as good as the 808 from the guy with the Ableton. So the thing is, um, you need to EQ, you need to gate, you need to compress. I do a lot of parallel compression uh, in the studio where I use like uh, different output compressions uh, in, in, in chain or parallel. And, um, and also, also we layer a lot. Sometimes we layer like a sample, like a, like a dusty fucked up sample kick. We layer it with, an, with a low 909 kick. So it gets a kind of like a little bit there's a little bit more meat to it it's not just a plain thing so i mean i think the drum machines or, or the machines in general 
are a starting point, they are a good starting point. They, for, for us, they, they transport a certain cultural um, um, environment where you know, like, okay, a 909, uh, 303, uh, and so on, puts the music into a pers perspective. But if you, if you wanted to make sound good, and if you wanted to make it sound contemporary in a certain way, you gotta put work into it, you know? I mean, you really gotta, like, tweak your stuff, you gotta know your stuff, you gotta use, pl use plugins, why not? Use outboard, use plugins, use guitar pedals, use whatever uh, suits you to make your sound sound special and maybe sets it apart, a little bit apart from, from, from all the rest of the people that mainly using the same kind of, e kind of equipment sometimes, you know? Um, just to add on to that, um, there is a difference, of course, between the studio recording and the live setting. So this is like very 909 based. We use the 909 just because we like it on a lot of records, but not entirely all the time. Uh, actually, it's kind of a mixture. And uh, we often we have uh, often these drum like sample layers, as Patrick said, and kind of uh, effects. And uh, it's you know we we are not trying to make 90s you know just because it's a 909 to make 90s sounding you know uh, 90s house you know with the the 909, uh, and uh, also the 909 isn't the greatest drum machine if you record it clean. It sounds live. I think it sounds pretty good, but it's pretty slick. So if you record it with a good, you know, sound card, it's a pretty clean sound, and that's not, not actually that what we actually look for. So the claps, you know, the bass drum, that's what we played on tape. A 909 kick on a tape machine sounds way different than a really clean 909 with a super sound card in Patrick's studio, you know, or wherever with modern sound cards which nowadays you know it's 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 a bit too straightforward so we use a lot of like um layering sampled sounds uh spring reverbs de delays phasers on like the rides or guitar pedals you know put guitar put pedals put the hi hat through yeah. a guitar pedal or through a oh, tube tube kind of tube stuff yeah. tube stuff whatever you know like, like whatever lays around and i mean i have we have a lot of stuff laying around so sometimes by random like we go we grab a pedal and we see okay what would this sound like if the ride goes through this sonic distortion pedal and you try it out and you'd be like ah, it's not that great and the pedal goes back into the shelf and then you know like it's it's a it's a it's a tryout thing um and it's 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 and 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 the, the cool thing is if you don't want to or cannot afford all this kind of hardware things i mean uh, uh there is so many extremely good tools in in like in ableton or or logic uh, it doesn't really come down to the money that you spend on your gear. It comes down what you do with it. I mean, there are sometimes there are uh, uh, funny ways of using stuff that are not to be meant to be used in that way or in that chain. And this is where the fun starts. If you if you use stuff outside of the ordinary, and that can be done in hardware, but that that can also be can also be done in your digital domain. It's uh, you know it's not it's not just possible if you do like this. And I would never. Uh, advocate for uh, for to be like okay you know you need to buy a drum computer to make a decent kind of that's not that's not true it's just what you feel comfortable with what you want to look at when you make music or what you want to feel like when you make music you know it's emotional thing and it should talk to you and it, sh it should make you happy while you do it if you look into your computer and you're not happy while doing it then maybe it's time to switch to something else and if I wouldn't be happy with what comes out of the 909 then I would use something else, you know. So I think it should talk. It should talk, talk back to you, uh, and make you want to use it. That's the, I think that's the only that's the only thing that 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 should matter w uh, when you use your 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 gear. No, thank you. <laughs> thank well, you. Thanks. Um, yeah. So we go for beer, right? Downstairs? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pack up. We'll pack up, and in case you have very, I don't know, uh, any kind of question from totally... Personal question that you want to say yeah. out loud in front of all or the other people? Then just ask us downstairs. Yeah.